Hello, Paul Pounds. I'm back. So, yeah, I've not been well again. It's constant. Um, it, it's been the thing. I can't say it because social media, all social media platforms tag, like, put restrictions on you when you mention the word, but the current health pandemic that's been sweeping the world... But I'm back, and I'm back on it, and I've got so many cool ideas for youtube -y stuff. So let's get on with the video and talk about some books. Hello, Paul Pounds. So yeah, sorry about the unintentional hiatus. Um, I've got so many comments and stuff to get back to. Uh, and I've got behind with all my YouTube channels that I like watching. I know uh, Alex the Buckybus has... Uh, she's put up a few more that I haven't got around to watching yet. So I'm going to crack on, make YouTube videos, watch YouTube videos, and generally get back on it. Um, if you don't subscribe to Alex's channel, the Buckybus, I think you should. She's very, very good. And she does pop up with some great suggestions. Anyway, so today I want to talk about... It's a bit of a Marmite topic, this. It's uh, the Titus Crow novels by Brian Lumley. Now, I'm quite a big fan of Brian Lumley. Um, although, I must admit, I haven't read the Necroscope series. It's... Uh, it's a bit daunting because there's so many books and they're so big. It's almost like why I haven't watched Game of Thrones yet. Everybody's like, you'd love Game of Thrones. I'm sure I would. But it's such an investment of my time that I can see stretching on into the future that, yeah, I haven't engaged with yet. But Necroscope is something I would like to read at some point. It's just uh, for now... It hasn't happened, but it's kind of like the one Brian Lumley rabbit hole that I've not been down yet. So if there's any similarities between the Titus Crow fiction and the Necroscope series, I uh, I might not pick up on it. Just so you know. I've also got a queue of uh, sponsors waiting to sponsor my videos, so let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. For over 25 years, the most powerful tool of the 20th century was kept in the back room until Wang opened the door to office automation. Wang helped put the computer at everyone's fingertips by simplifying data processing, revolutionizing word processing, and combining them on one system. And the future looks even brighter. Because at Wang, we never stop opening doors. I'm very juvenile. That genuinely made me laugh. <laughs> so, The Burrowers Beneath came out in 1974. And structurally, it's... Uh, it's it's a lot like Dracula. It's built up of uh, like letters and journal entries and articles. And that that's how kind of the narrative is built. It's based on two short stories... Uh, that Brian Lumley kind of cobbled together, Cement Surroundings and The Night the Sea Maid Went Down. Um, and it it kind of, the first novel centres around Titus Crow, who is a, almost like an amateur mystic, thrust into a battle against the forces of Cthulhu, which... Uh, it, it it works for me. I'm a big fan of the whole Cthulhu mythos thing. But it soon becomes apparent in this series that it's, it's like a Holmes and Watson thing. The person collating these stories is Henry... I don't know how to pronounce it. Laurent de Margany. My French leaves a lot to be desired. And this first novel, I think, is one of the reasons why this whole series 
is disliked so much. The the Titus Crow novels are there's so much hate for them and so much admiration for them. I love them. So let's have a look at them from the point of view from you know the point of view of somebody that thinks they're brilliant. So Titus is uh, is quite cool, um, quite aloof, a bit. It, it reminds me a lot, and other comparisons will be drawn here. It reminds me a lot of um, William Hartnell's portrayal of the Doctor. Just that, I don't know, there's just something about him. He's a very well-written character and a very enjoyable character to read his, uh, his adventures. Like the title suggests, there's something under the surface, something uh, chthonic that's, that's got... It's not going to end well. But, unlike a lot of Lovecraft's fiction... You get the feeling that Titus and Henry, they're going to do all right. They're going to get there. And this has been a huge criticism from a lot of Lovecraft fans. I'm not saying I'm a better Lovecraft fan. I am just a... There's different types of, like, Lovecraft and Cthulhu Mythos fans. And it, it's like with any fandom... When it's like a huge expanded universe that anybody can contribute to, not all of it is going to appeal to you. Not all, not everything I've read, Cthulhu-wise, is appealing to me. Um, I just happen to like the fact that somebody begins to succeed against these great old ones. It's almost like a Lovecraft trope that it's somebody jotting down their final thoughts and recounting this tale of occult woe and misery while something's slithering under the door or creeping into their room or and then finishing by writing ah and I I just think it's nice just to have that have a character or characters that we can get attached to in some way and they have continuing adventures um, because of lo a lot of Lovecraft's protagonists went potty or died horribly so it's it's quite nice to have yeah characters that that you can get used to and get behind and get to like with more stories and adventures. Now, Lumley's style is very pulpy in a good way. And this is something that we're going to keep coming back to because I think that's one of the main reasons that these novels are disliked. Um... By so many people. One thing that I really feel about all the Titus Crow novels is that they're like an RPG and I loved playing the, Cth the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Uh, I've loved it for decades. I think it's wonderful and it often ends up a little bit more light-hearted And sometimes characters die in the game. For those of you that don't know, it's like Dungeons and Dragons, but set in the worlds of H.P. Lovecraft. And in those kind of games, you need characters. You need to get attached to the character you're playing because then self-preservation kicks in. And that's what it feels like with, uh, with Lumley's novels. Also, there's the element of the story being uncovered as we go through letters and journal entries and stuff, like I said. And that's that's kind of a role-playing game uh, device to further the plot. 
so much so that when I read them in the 90s, yeah, it must have been early 90s, there was a couple of us that actually... It, it wasn't like a structured role-playing game. It was like live role-play and almost like an augmented reality game that we didn't have a structure to. We were kind of similar characters and it, it's, it probably sounds ridiculous now, but at the time it was tremendous fun. November Binks, I'm looking at you, mate. Yeah. So I think the mix of genuine, like, pulp nostalgia and it almost being like a role-playing game has put some people off. The perception of Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos nowadays is kind of different from the pulp adventures of the 30s and 40s. Um, and Lumley can write horror. If you read any of Brian Lumley's short stories that are just like balls to the wall horror, they're fantastic. No Sharks in the Med is horrible and like, oh, might just because I'm frightened of sharks and things under the sea. But like, this dude can write horror. So the fact that the Titus Crow novels are a pulpy adventure, that was tremendously intentional. That was obviously like Brian Lumley's intent because he can do horror and he decided not to do out and out horror in these novels and his uh his knowledge and passion and adoration for the cthulhu mythos just it is saturated in every page so the next one is the transition of titus crow and uh, it's set 10 years after what the events that occurred in the Burrowers Beneath. And uh, it's just Henry on his own for the minute. Uh, Henry's great. I, I love Henry. Um, when we did play that weird augmented reality live role-playing game, I was always the Henry type of guy, the kind of stoic companion. That's I, I never wanted to be Holmes. I always wanted to be Watson. I never wanted to be, like, I can't think, I never wanted to be Sapphire, I wanted to be Steel, that one don't work. <laughs> so, Henry's on his own at the start of this one, and eventually Titus returns, and the rest of the novel is Titus recounting his adventures, and it's very much like uh, pulp sci-fi, it's like... Um, it's almost like Jules Verne or H.G. Wells, but with a with like a Hawkwind record on in the background. It's it's quite psychedelic and quite uh, surreal in parts. So there's a lot about dimensional travel and time travel, um, and this is another uh, analogy where uh, that kind of relates to Doctor Who, and. I think people want, certain readers want a straightforward Cthulhu horror story. And Brian Lumley didn't deliver that. Now, this isn't a straight up horror series. So if you're, I, I think this is one of the reasons why people dislike it. If you're looking for that, if you're like reading the Cthulhu mythos and enjoying br brilliant stories that are more in the the style of how m modern readers perceive the mythos, I think this is going to disappoint you. You know, earlier on, I was talking about the different types of kind of Lovecraft fans when. When I was growing up, uh, I read uh, like the Dreamland stuff as well, 
just because it was there. I just devoured everything I could find. And like the Silver Key and all the Randolph Carter stuff and the White Ship. And that was equally exciting as Lovecraft's horror stuff. And Lovecraft was almost like as much a fantasist as he was a horror writer. And I know one of his big influences was Lord Dunsany and I I adore Lord Dunsany's stuff and I'm a little bit uh, my judgement is clouded on Lord Dunsany because my gran was a big fan and my gran was a folklorist and into uh, myths and legends and ancient history of where she lived and knew everything about all sorts of stuff in North Yorkshire and when I used to go for school holidays, I'd read Lord Dunsany and then we'd go on these expeditions to find these these weird forgotten, uh, like, stepping stones or a little tiny stone circle or something just, just hidden away in a little forest. And that's all tied together for me in that magical exploration. So when, when uh, Brian Lumley writes more embraces that whole Lovecraft fandom rather than just the horror. I get it because I think for a lot of people that Lovecraft's fantasy stuff it, it can be a little bit dry. Um, not dry in the same way that Tolkien is. Um, I, right, I love Tolkien. But he's the only writer that can take five pages to describe a field and you get the history of the field and everything about the field and the soil type and memories of people sat in the field and and that that early 20th century era of fantasy isn't necessarily what we equate to fantasy now it was uh people like i think people like robert e howard that turned it into a battle, into combat, into sword and sorcery, into thrilling adventure, rather than, ooh, that's a strange and mysterious world. We're also introduced to Tiania, uh, Titus Crow's love interest. And this goes back to kind of when pulps were contemporary. The, there was romance. Now, I, I'm not like an expert on pulps. I just like... Uh, I like 30s and 40s, well, 20s, 30s and 40s music and fiction and films and style and all that kind of stuff. So I have read a lot of pulpy adventures and a lot of pulps from that time do feature romance. And this is Lumley demonstrating, I think, I think his knowledge of older style pulp fiction and not necessarily the horror that people associate with Lovecraft. Um, and if you read some, uh, like Weird Tales, is the, the magazine is, is like a classic of weird fiction. But it's not, or it's not a horror publication. There were horror stories in it, but there were eerie romances and obviously Robert E. Howard's Conan stories and Solomon Kane stories. So it's not a, a punchy horror publication. And I think Lumley got that with his Titus Crow novels and went back and looked at the components that made up kind of 30s pulp. And I also think after the slightly more horror-influenced uh, Burrowers Beneath. I think the transition of Titus Crow was too much of a departure uh, genre-wise to keep a lot of readers interested. It it really does feel more like a, a, a Dreamlands-type uh, novel, which neatly leads us on to The Clock of Dreams. So if uh, Transition of Titus Crow was more of a time travel pulp science fiction kind of thing, The Clock of Dreams is very much a fantasy. But in the vein of more of like Clark Ashton Smith and writers like that. So Titus 
and uh, Tiania uh, trapped and in dire peril. There's lots of peril and it's always dire. And Henry has to go off and rescue them. And this is... Uh, kind of want to this is where henry starts to shine you know like in lord of the rings frodo is a whining git it's sam that is the hero of lord of the rings he literally picks him up and carries him like sam without sam frodo would just be like crying in a corner somewhere and it's the same kind of thing maybe not quite as much but henry is the uh Henry is the glue that holds the partnership together. Again, this one brings a lot of criticism from Lovecraft fans. And I'm not saying that anybody's not a fan or not as big a fan as me or anything like that. You you know, the, the Cthulhu mythos, the Lovecraft mythos, that whole stable of writers that wrote together and wrote each other into each other's stories and had so much fun with it, and continues to happen up to the present day, you take what you like best from that. And sometimes a anthology of just straight up, quite stereotypical Cthulhu mythos fiction is what you want to read, 100%. Um, and Lumley's short stories are more that. Um, if you, Like The Taint and... Uh, Dagon's Bell and things like that. It's more straight up mythos horror short stories. The Titus Crow novels uh, do seem to be Lovecraft's homage to the pulps. Next up is Spawn of the Winds, and uh, we don't get any Titus in this. We get Hank Silverhut, who is uh, a new introduction to the gang who's quite I like Hank he's he is straight out of like an Edgar Rice Burroughs novel and again we're going back to Lumley's passion for pulp fiction and how how that's written and how that's presented there's uh, love interests and strong fearsome characters and uh, like heroes and yeah they're fighting against great old ones and all the assorted bad gits from the Cthulhu mythos and Lumley's like I said before Lumley's knowledge of the mythos is probably second to none he puts all sorts in there it's like a smorgasbord of unpronounceable names and by now, I'm sure you figured that, that Brian Lumley was changing up the popular genre, popular pulp genre of each novel. So this one feels a lot more like a, a kind of sword and sorcery type um, thing. Not so much the fantasy of Clock of Dreams. This is more uh, of a, uh, well, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Robert E. Howard type novel so in the moons of Borea uh, Titus is lost somewhere in his mad clock that's comparisons can be drawn between that and the TARDIS but let's not for now and it's Hank and Henry teaming up and this this little gang of uh, warriors fighting against this tremendous evil. Regular viewers of my channel will know with things like The Guardians and The Specialist and you give me a series of books with heroes fighting evil on a regular basis and their recurring characters and I am in. So amongst other things, there's probably that hook that draws me in as well. This one is more like tremendous pulp adventure. This one isn't a horror book. Most of them aren't horror books in any way, shape or form. 
but because of Lumley's pedigree and the reputation he's got as a horror writer and again marketing 101 this is how the uh, how they're presented as horror books when you buy them and read them thinking it's going to be some great creepy Cthulhu mythos type story then you're disappointed and it's again it's like and it happens with filmmakers and publishers and they provide you with an expectation to get you to buy the book and then when it's not that you're a bit like well we're a bit rubbish if they'd if the publisher had, had kind of said it's one of the greatest fantasy epics of all time not that I'm saying it is, it's just like if they'd use that as kind of some kind of tagline, we'd have better expectations of what is contained within these wonderful novels. So the last novel in the series is Elysia. 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 And Lumley ends the series with a bang. It's brilliant. It's the crescendo, the finale... Henry is fighting the forces of Cthulhu. The great old ones are rising. It's happening. It's on. Shit's about to get real. And Henry's trying to sort it. I bloody love Henry. So all the gang get together. Henry's helped out by Maureen, his love interest. Every All the, all the like rugged male heroes get a, a, a flutteringly like eyelashed heroin love interest. And it's brilliant. And we're going to get, I am going to talk a little bit about the whole pulp aesthetic when we've talked about the novels. But the heroes do get paired off with the ladies. But yeah, it's a whole satisfying end, I think, to the series. It feels like it's wrapped up. But it's not horror. If you want in horror, then... There is a collection of Brian Lumley short stories called The Complete Crow, which is all the Titus Crow short stories. And, yeah, if you want in straightforward Cthulhu horror, don't read the Titus Crow novels. If you're fancying a bit of pulp adventure and you're just happy to go with the flow and go with the ride and just... Listen to the story that Brian Lumley's telling you without the expectations that it's going to be like horrific and exciting, then I think you'll probably enjoy them. So there's an interview with, I'm, I'm going off topic, but it will come back to what we're talking about. There's an interview with Ken Russell that I can't find, but it was something that, that stuck. Actually, I think it might be on the. Uh, as one of the extras on the Devil's uh, British DVD release, which is such a wonderful film. And he was talking about, like with the Devils, the, the interviewer asked, why was it so stylistic? How was it like that? And Ken Russell said, you've got to remember that at the time that these events were happening, Every all the technology they had, every uh, form of entertainment they had, everything that influenced them was cutting edge. So he tried to make it like look like it was modern, but set back then because it will have been modern for the characters in the film. And I think Lumley's done the same with the Titus Crow novels. He's made them contemporary to the kind of thirties pulps and kept the uh, narrative aesthetic of what was popular then I'm sure if these were released in the 30s they would have been absolutely huge and they wouldn't have met with as much criticism as they do now there's an interview with Brian Lumley uh, from 1984 Edward Berglund interviewed him and uh, I've got I've got it on me on my phone. He asks him about the criticism. And Brian Lumley says, De Camp and Carter's Conan tales grate on the nerves of Howardians. The new adventures of James Bond irritate Fleming fans. 
August Derleth's pastiches and posthumous collaborations take a lot of stick from so-called Lovecraft purists, so why shouldn't I also cop it? On the other hand, why should I? Maybe I'm seen as some sort of plagiarist like I'm in it for the money. What the fans should realise is this, that to get involved with Lovecraft and the mythos to the, de to the degree that I have been, is to be, or have been, one heck of a fan in my own right. And that's right. Like I said, the mythos and all of Lovecraft, if you just take Lovecraft's fiction, there's so many different genres and styles. You take what you like best from that. But if you look at the Cthulhu mythos as a whole, that is like multiplied so many times. There's so much stuff in there. And you you take what you what moves you out of it. And as a writer, Brian Lumley is taking more of that thrilling pulp strangeness rather than Lovecraftian horror. So Brian in this interview, Brian Lumley goes on to say, As for the people who approve my work in this vein, they are quite simply readers. Not critics, not Lovecraft-stricken fungus beasts, not frustrated, uninspired would-be scribblers who can't construct a single paragraph of gripping fiction, and not psychological analysts of a man dead these 45 years, but readers. Fans I love. I was and am one myself. He's also asked about the, uh, the whole Doctor Who thing and uh, influences from other uh, investigators and literary occult investigators. And Lumley says, Readers have doubtless linked Crow with Doctor Who because of the time clock. But the dear old clock was alive and well back in 1934 to 1935 in the, super in the superb Price Lovecraft collaboration through the gates of the Silver Key. And of course, Crow is more occultist than scientist. And uh, Edward Berglund also asked him about the name Titus. As for Mervyn Peake, I blush to admit it, but I still haven't read Gormenghast. So it wasn't even like Titus Crow, uh, Titus Groan. So I'm going to leave it there. There's plenty. If you fancy these novels, they're great and cheap. There's some chunky omnibus editions that you can get super cheap. You can get them individually. There's there's so many editions of the Titus Crow novels. But they're not horror. But The Complete Crow is more horror. Or just stick with uh, Lumley's novellas and mythos short fiction. Because that is uh, more more horror than the psychedelic pulp adventures of Titus and Henry and their assorted chums and love interests. So thank you for watching guys um, and I will see you in the next video.